Okay, good morning. You're all very, very welcome this morning to our important webinar on modern slavery, a topic that we've touched on in CEF uh, in recent times. And I know it's important to all of you, whether you're working on these shores or working further afield. Um, this morning, we're delighted we have Gavin Miller with us from Clear 54. Gavin uh, has been in touch with us and, and has a, a background which he will explain to you, uh, which I think is highly relevant uh, to the work that we're all trying to do in our own industry. Uh, in terms of modern slavery. Um, members amongst you there will realise we did uh, a task force piece of work last year with our People and Skills Task Force and produced some, some guidance on modern slavery. So during the, the course of this webinar this morning, we're going to uh, put that on our website again for you, just to make that easy to find. Um, but Gavin also has useful materials here and his contact details will be at the end and you can follow up with him. Format of the webinar, I'm just going to hand over to Gavin in a minute. Gavin's going to go through a presentation with you for about 30 minutes, 35 minutes, and then we'll take questions and answers. The best way for doing questions and answers, please, if you're familiar with Zoom by now, if you're down at the bottom of your screen, you see the Q&A button. If you would submit your questions there, I will pick those up at the end and pose those uh, on your behalf to Gavin. Um, but with no more ado then, Gavin, uh, delighted to welcome you this morning to CF, and I'll hand over to you let you take us forward. Super. Well, thank you very much indeed. Uh, thank you for letting me take part today and I uh, appreciate everybody who's listening in. So uh, good morning, everybody. And uh, thank you for letting me talk today about a really crucial issue that affects millions of people around the world, modern slavery. It's not an easy topic to discuss, but it is an important one. And I'd like to delve into what modern slavery is, how it happens, why it happens, but however, I'm not here to scare you or make you feel helpless. I want to show you that there are simple, proportionate measures that we can all take within your businesses to prevent this crime from touching you and your business. But let me start by asking you a question to get you thinking. What would you risk your life for? Would you risk it to save somebody else's life, your family, your friends, for money? What about freedom? Would you risk your life for freedom? It's a difficult question to answer, and the answer might depend on what your version of freedom is. But what if that risk is not only your own life? What if your actions could be potentially risking the lives of your family as well? And sadly, these are the thoughts and decisions that a victim of trafficking might have to consider every day. The pandemic has led to a widespread social economic instability, surging global unemployment and increase in extreme poverty. And in addition, war and environmental changes has resulted in the displacement of millions of people. It's estimated that 1.5 billion people will be displaced by 2050. And that represents a significant opportunity for organized crime groups to make money. And shockingly, even at this time, it believes it generates over $150 billion annually for organized crime. So what's this got to do with you? Thousands of years ago, the construction of the seven wonders of the world, as many as other ancient structures were always built on the back of slaves. Maybe there's a couple of people of the older generation listening this morning who remember them being built. Slavery is a common practice in the ancient world. It's estimated that tens of thousands were slaves were used to construct the great pyramids of Giza alone. Historically, from the 1500s, the slave trade through the transatlantic slave routes was commercialized, racialized, and inherited with enslaved people being viewed as commodities. The slave trade was abolished in the UK in 1807 and throughout the colonies by 1833 when the government created a fund to compensate the slave owners for their loss of property. But it's still just as relevant today. It was only last week that the royal family have made public that they're going to research their involvement in slavery. But it's not just foreign migrants and ancestors who were affected. If we think closer to home, Irish immigrants displaced to the US from the famine onwards found themselves in dangerous and low-paid low paid jobs, facing job discrimination and exploitation, such as building the skyscrapers in New York. The truth is that the construction industry is not immune to the problem of modern slavery today. 
in fact, is an industry where there are risks due to its complex supply chain, its reliance on low-skilled and migrant workers. This means that there are lots of opportunities for exploitation to occur at every stage in a project's life cycle, from the sourcing of materials to the final delivery of the project. I'd like to go on now and talk about what modern slavery looks like today. The current legislation, the differences between smuggling and trafficking, the reasons so many people are open to exploitation, and lastly, some clear signs that we can all look out for. Modern slavery is the exploitation and commodification of men, women, and children for financial or sexual gain. It means that I have moved somebody from point A to point B because once I get them to point B, I'm going to exploit them. And forced compulsory labor is any labor that's obtained through threats or penalties and is very common in modern slavery. And nearly 90% of victims of labor exploitation are working in businesses. So when we talk about people smuggling and people trafficking, there are clear differences. Uh, I know that everybody likes things to be black and white, and as we get a bit more uh, aware of topics, things become more grey, but, but generally there are clear differences between smuggling and trafficking. People smuggling is an immigration crime that involves a movement of people who pay to reach their destination using a smuggling route. Once the person arrives in the country they want to go to, the relationship with the smuggler ends and there's no further exploitation. In contrast, trafficking is a control of movement of people for the purposes of exploiting them. So if we think about what's happening in the English Channel and you've got the people, the smugglers, who are putting people on the small dinghies at Cali, once they've got the guys on the boats and sending them across the English Channel, they don't care what happens to them. That's smuggling. Trafficking is that they're moving them because they want to get them to that final destination because it's there that they're going to use them and exploit them for money. If we look at some of the reasons a potential victim will be vulnerable, I would suggest that some of the most important factors are going to be their migration status, language barriers, recruitment fees, homelessness, lack of a social network. Migrants who do not know their rights are less likely to call out discrimination and pay in working conditions. Undocumented workers can have their migration status used against them and force them into poor working conditions. And of course, workers who do not speak English are vulnerable as it's difficult for them to access support and help. So I'm sure you're asking, how can I spot the signs? Well, I want to reassure everybody listening today that it's common sense. Trust your gut. Usually your gut will tell you that something is wrong. That's your experience and your knowledge and in, in the topic that you're interested in and you, in your work in life. It's not going to be because you had a bad meal last night. Trust, trust your gut. Look at somebody's physical appearance. They might look unkempt, malnourished, frightened, dirty, withdrawn or confused. They might have injuries that can't explain, bruises, scars, scratches. They might have little money or food, little or very unsuitable clothing. The lack of suitable clothing and footwear might be really obvious for yourself to identify when you're on a site. The worker might rarely be left alone and seem under the control of someone else who's always speaking on their behalf. And this person might be controlling their passport and might be the person who drives them to and from work as well. And also victims quite often will avoid on eye contact. They'll really seem frightened and might even refuse help when initially offered. So I'd now talk about it. There isn't a clear line defining where exploitation begins and where exploitation ends. It's a graduated curve. Exploitation accounts for all situations that stray from what would be classed as decent work, from labour infringements 
right through to the severe forms of exploitation. So examples of poor practice could be non-payment of minimum wage, lack of equipment, demeaning treatment, fewer no breaks. And for those things, potentially they can be addressed through your company, through the trade union, through the GLAA, maybe HMRC's National Minimum Wage Team, through the Health and Safety Executive. Whereas examples of forced labour, where work is controlled, forced or coerced, where people have had their identity documents taken from them and they're receiving no payment, then that's potentially when the police might get involved and we're talking about examples of modern slavery through forced labour. So, so the question is for who am I to be talking about this topic? So uh, as Mark kindly said at the start, my name is Gavin Miller. I have over 30 years experience in the UK law enforcement, uh, working on a number of successful human trafficking operations in Northern Ireland as a senior investigating officer. My responsibilities were to collaborate with partners to investigate, detect and enforce the relevant legislation to bring offenders to justice. And there has been a number of notable successes here in Northern Ireland. My responsibility and privilege was to make a life changing differences to victims, giving some of them hope and freedom where they had none. After retiring, I volunteered with a relevant NGO, but I wanted to use my knowledge and experience further. So I founded Clear 54, which is a social enterprise focused on prevention and labour exploitation. And prevention is really crucial because prosecution rates are really low due to the complexity of the, of the crime and the control exercised by the traffickers. Modern slavery in Ireland today can take many different forms and it can often appear quite normal. And that's why some people call it the crime hidden in plain sight. But since Brexit, there's been a real increase in the potential exploitation in Ireland due to the increase of trade and movement. The Republic is frequently used as a transit country for victims entering into Northern Ireland. In the UK, it's estimated that any one time there's roughly 130,000 of victims working it alone. And Europol has identified the UK as one of the main destinations for traffickers working in Europe. When I started in the Modern Slavery Human Trafficking Unit in 2016 here, there was 34 men and women identified as potential victims. In the last financial year, there was 547. In Northern Ireland, we have our own law, own Pacific law in human trafficking, and it's called the Human Trafficking and Exploitation Act. And it created specific criminal offences, law enforcement powers, and protection for victims, the introduction of the Independent Anti-Slavery Commissioner, and also in relation to TISC, Transparency and Supply Chain. And Section 54 of the Act requires businesses with a turnover of £36 million or more to report on their efforts to prevent modern slavery in their supply chain. And that, that's why I've called my company Clear 54. A modern slavery statement should include information about the organization and its supply chains, its policies relating to modern slavery and its due diligence processes. The UK government has proposed changes to strengthen this law, such as expanding reporting requirements to include public bodies and making the specific topics in the statement compulsory but that will have to be dependent on passing through legislation. To date, 21,000 organizations have already submitted their modern slavery statements to the government registry. But to the people who are listening today who potentially don't fall into that level of turnover, I'm really keen to talk about what a modern slavery preventative plan could look like for a smaller business. This plan helps businesses identify and prevent potential risks of modern slavery. It's important to be aware of the reputational 
operational and even legal consequences of not having a plan in place. So to think about creating a plan, you can start by asking yourself a few questions. Do you pay the minimum or the living wage? Do you directly employ all or most of your employees? Do you have a health and safety policy? Do you have an internal policy to report concerns? Do you employ local people? Do your staff have contracts in their own language that they can understand? Do you only employ people aged 18 or older? I'm sure for the vast majority of people listening today, the answer of course is going to be yes. And in Northern Ireland, because many of the potential risks are already mitigated due to the size and the makeup of most of the businesses here, we already have a lot of the key building blocks that you'd ever need to create your own preventative plan. I'm not saying that to be complacent, and I hope every year people increase their knowledge and the response, but there's no reason not to promote the advances that already exist here. Having a modern slavery preventative plan can be a unique selling point for your company. It shows that your value ethical practices and can help you stand out from competitors. It makes you a really attractive partner for other businesses who want to mitigate risk and include you in potential tenders. But it's not only the UK that has legislation. The EU is planning to bring in legislation next year under the Sustainable Corporate Governance Directive. There is standalone legislation in France, in Germany, in the Netherlands, in Canada, in Australia, America has really, really strong legislation in relation to labour exploitations. So this is something that Britain started off, but other countries are now taking involvement and might even supersede the UK in their legislation. But it's something that people are more and more aware of. So it's important that we address the issues ourselves. So up till now, while I've been giving this talk, I've talked about modern slavery prevented. I've talked about it being a good and ethical thing for businesses to get involved in. We've then moved on to talk about how it's just good business sense to think about modern slavery preventative work that can be done. And now we want to talk about where the government has introduced a bit of a carrot and stick. And that's a new procurement notice, the PNN 01 bar 21 in Northern Ireland. It focuses on social value scoring for public procurement contracts. And social value is about creating positive impacts on individuals, communities, and the environment. From June 1st, 2022, public sector tenders must allocate 10% of the award criteria to social values and services and work contracts where the public contract regulations apply. This minimum weighting is meant to increase up to 20% after approval by no laughing by the executive. So the notice specifies four themes on which social value will be scored. Increasing secure employment and skills, the modern slavery one of building ethical and resilient supply chains, delivering zero carbon and promoting well-being. The modern slavery theme, which is a focus of this talk and the indicators are on this slide. So. I'll leave the slide up for a second and I'll have a wee drink of juice and you can have a wee read of them. Thank you. Okay. So to gain further insight, I've submitted a freedom information into the Department of Finance uh, on uh, site on tenders in relation to construction. And it has found that the building uh, ethical and resilient supply chain themes has been included as one of the four optional themes within the procurement of a framework to provide construction related professional services already. Each supplier seeking to be appointed to the framework was required to achieve at least 150 points within the social value delivery plan. The framework was awarded to four consultant practices. And two of the four included the modern slavery theme in their tender submissions and they received points for doing it as you can see from the screen one received 20 points for including a micro enterprise located in northern ireland within the first four months within the supply chain 
and another successful tender included business development and knowledge sharing and we've seen 10 points in relation to it. I'd also like to highlight the separate theme of increasing secure employment and skills where points are awarded for creating employment retaining and other return to work opportunities for those furthest from the labour market. And I would like to highlight and say that victims of trafficking completely fit that bill and are potential employees that could you could maybe look to involve in your uh, businesses going forward, even in training. So it's really important to think about how your business can achieve the necessary points and potentially your business could add points to a main contractor's tender submission. Also, that modern slavery is a theme which should be considered in a contract and for you to answer. Thank you. So, oh, bet this guy maybe gave you a bit of a jump. And that's what he wanted to do. This is Ion Lakatus. He was arrested this year. He is a convicted human trafficker, illegal gang master, and he was involved in trafficking people into the UK for exploitation, conspiring to traffic, traffic people into the UK to exploit, acting as an unlicensed gang master, and converting criminal property. Lakatus had been involved in recruiting victims to work on a prediction line, a food producer in County Down. Over 20 victims worked with no pay and squalid conditions for many months before the business called the police. And they only called the police when they saw some of the victims eating raw meat from the factory floor. The victims were in total fear of Lakatus and his gang. It was a gang who provided bank accounts which were controlled by the gang rather than bank details of the workers. So all the money that these guys were working, working went to the, went to the organized crime group rather than the actual workers themselves. I hasten to say the company had absolutely no knowledge about this criminality at the time, but of course their details did enter the public domain during the investigation and the trial. Lakatus entering Northern Ireland again reinforces the need to remain vigilant, but also the efforts suspects will make to restart their criminality if they perceive a weakness to exploit. We've had a number of really good successful prosecutions for human traffickers in Northern Ireland. But to date, there's not been any within the construction sector. But in my opinion, is it likely that labour exploitations are occurring in Northern Ireland today? Then I would say absolutely yes. Last year in County Armagh, there was a case of rural exploitation occurred where victims had their bank cards taken from them and their wages removed from them by the, the traffickers every Friday. This went on for over a month without any notice from the employers. The group of foreign nationals claimed that they were being treated really poorly and were not being paid. They were hungry, they were cold. When they came to the police, they were immediately safeguarded, given shelter and support. They, they did refuse to make statements, but they wanted to be repatriated home. And that's what happened. They were all flown home as soon as practically it was done. The suspects, they also quickly fled the country and none of them have ever returned to Northern Ireland. But we then went to work with the GLAA and we spoke to the employers who were unaware of the circumstances. And as a result, they then changed their payroll policy and placed extra safeguards around recruitment agencies. But consider the reputational damage if that had been made public. So how to stop this happening to you? It, it's really not rocket science. It's just recognizing that there may be a risk in following a real simple checklist and showing a professional curiosity around your staff and your sites. But it's not just Northern Ireland where these crimes are occurring. In 2019, three members of a Romanian family were found guilty of modern slavery offenses in England. They had been exploiting up to 500 people between 2009 and 2018. And in a later trial in Romania, six other gang members were convicted. This gang had placed victims across a range of building and demolition projects across London, ranging from small sites to major developments. And the gang used a variety of fraudulent tactics to gain fake credentials to access the workplace. 
the Met Police identified at least 33 companies, including contractors, agencies, and umbrella payroll providers who had all unwittingly been paying into the accounts controlled by the organised crime group. During the 18-month investigation, only four people were aware of what was happening within the company, the CEO, the construction director, the site manager, and the payroll specialist. And as the time went on, the construction director was so surprised at how easily the vulnerable people blended into the rest of the workforce. There was no sign of tension or coercion within the group, and all the paperwork and ID documents were in order. The only red flag for these guys was the payroll. Later, during the trial, management later discovered that the organised crime group had scoped out their company before introducing the victims to their sites. I recently had a meeting where I learned that potentially there was a rise in agency workers working in construction in Northern Ireland. And this is really concerning because historically, there've been issues where agencies are not checking the working conditions of their employees. According to a recent audit in England, many companies are failing to check with the regulations and this can result in poor working conditions for the workers. A recent audit found that 31% of companies couldn't prove that they had done sufficient checks. And after they did check, 20% of those companies found that the recruitment agencies were applying non-standard charges to workers. And some of the workers had lost as much as 25% of their weekly wage through these non-standard deductions. If you are using a third party recruitment agency to hire employees, it's so important to be aware of the potential risks especially when the workers are being recruited from abroad. To mitigate the risk of modern slavery while using labour providers, you could consider doing the following. Conduct one-off checks with the labour provider. Conduct regular checks of agency workers' documents. Regularly engage with the workers themselves. In addition, ask yourself some key questions to help identify. How do you ensure workers on your site know how much they should be getting paid? Do you have a publicised reporting process for complaints for the workers? Do you have access to a translation service within your organisation? Be visible on your sites and address issues when they're raised. Having a you said we did approach is a really, really good way to go forward. To effectively prevent modern slavery in business, it's really important to take, well, the Anti-Slavery Commissioner talks about take inspiration from health and safety legislation. And just as health and safety, it's important to identify the risks, address the risks, and take measures to prevent its reoccurrence. While it may seem now a bit like a burden, implementing small changes can put your company ahead of the curve and allow it to be a force for good. To all the business owners and senior managers who are listening in this morning, it's so crucial to set the tone from the top. One way to do this is to provide standalone mandatory modern slavery training to all your staff. Consider identifying a business champion who can take the lead throughout the year, updating your own preventative plan or modern slavery statement. Project Site managers should be aware of the signs and indicators of modern slavery, such as poor hygiene, health issues, and injuries. All staff members should be aware of the signs and know how to report concerns, and importantly, feel supported if they do report concerns. It's important to have a reporting policy. Some people call it a whistleblowing policy, but I, I just don't like that word that covers concerns if someone thinks that there's something happening within the company or within the site supply chain. And it's really important to provide real life examples for staff to refer to, to make it real and relevant for them to understand. In most cases, raising concerns internally will be the most appropriate race of action, but staff could also raise concerns with Unseen, which is the NGO run a confidential modern slavery helpline number 24 hours. Potentially, you put it to the GLAA 
or potentially you could do it through Crime Stoppers if you want to remain anonymous, or through the Police 101 system, or if you need immediate help, contact by 999. Lastly, as I mentioned in the previous slide, site visits can be a real, very valuable for preventing modern slavery in businesses. While labour providers can be beneficial for sectors with fluctuating production levels, they increase the level of exploitation in the workforce. The risk is especially high when labour providers outsource to other labour providers, making it difficult to maintain oversight and accountability. As a small business owner, it can be really confusing to think about where green supply chain starts and finishes. However, it's really important to consider that nearly all countries have criminalized trafficking since the year 2000 with the Palermo Protocol. And taking steps to ensure a clean supply chain is not only ethically responsible, but a legal requirement in most countries. So if you buy your supplies from a multinational supplier, it's likely that they already have a modern slavery statement in place. So jobs done as far as that checking is concerned. However, for the bigger companies, or if you want to go into a deeper dive, it's really important to identify high, medium, low risk suppliers and then work methodically through them. The risk can be dependent on the product or the country of origin. But please remember, solutions should be proportionate to the size of the business. Sometimes the supplier just needs to be informed and by merely explaining what the UK attitude towards child and labour exploitation is, that you'll find they've already taken action and they've already got circumstances in place. Reassure the supplier that you're not looking for a way to knock their price down, but to say that you're an ethical company and you're looking for some information from them to show that they are too. Start working slowly and methodically. Set achievable key performance indicators and start internally first, such as increasing the number of staff trained and identifying the signs, increasing contact with subcontractors, increasing the number of site visits. It's also important to check on the conditions of those who are potentially involved in catering, cleaning and security at your sites. Look at the tier one suppliers as crucial, but it's also worth considering the impact your work to prevent it's also, sorry, it's also important to consider what your impact is in the local community. You could support local charities and organizations that work to prevent human trafficking and exploitation. Finally, as I raised in the, the social value, it's really worth considering offering employment opportunities to victims of training and exploitation. And this approach can really help provide a sense of worth to the victims and reduce the, the risk of re-trafficking. It is really not shameful to find any issue within your supply chain, but it is shameful not to do anything about it. And by taking steps to ensure a clean supply chain, you can not only protect your business from legal and, opportunity, legal and reputational risk, but can also make a positive impact on the lives of those who may be being exploited. I'm getting close to the end now. There are several tools and resources available to help organisations combat modern slavery within the construction industry. The Home Office Statutory Guidance provides detailed advice to organisations to comply with Section 54. And there are several reporting and due diligence guidance of documents available from companies such as the Ethical Trading Initiative and the Core Coalition. In addition, there are several tools and resources available to help organizations put policies into action and find other organizations to work with. For example, the Respect International Resource Center provides a wealth of information on forced labor and the, respons the responsible sourcing tool offers practical guidance on how to identify and address signs of forced labor. But also, you're very welcome to contact me. I will help or sign so It's uh, 
it's not only important to talk the talk, but walk the walk too. So I've put up a couple of testimonies of people who I've had dealings with in the past and kind of given some words. So it's really important to consider the potential reputational damage that could result from being associated with modern slavery and human trafficking. Consumers are becoming increasingly aware of the issue and more likely to support companies that demonstrate a commitment to ethical and responsible business practice. And a really effective approach, as I've said before, is through training and education. Shining a light on this subject provides workers and consumers the resources they need to help to take action to mitigate the risks to your business. Finally, if you're really if you're interested in learning more about this topic, and I hope some of you are, please feel free to get in touch with me. And if you do, I'll provide you with a link to a really superb, excellent, free, I reiterate, a free government-funded online training course which covers the topic of modern slavery. It's most relevant, relevant, relevant to colleagues who deal with the financial side of things, but it's a fantastic learning tool for all. It was created by Themis, which is a purpose-led organization, uh, which is committed to reducing uh, global impact on financial crime. But it's, it's a superb piece of kit and please get in touch and I'll send you the link. So uh, that's me finished now. Uh, thank you very much indeed for listening and uh, I'm very happy to answer any questions. Gavin, thank you so much. Very, very comprehensive cover there. J just to reiterate, to members, we are in direct conversations at the minute with some public sector clients, Education Authority particularly, and Housing Executive who are working with us really to identify how they can gain assurance that contractors that they're appointing are taking modern slavery seriously. One of the things which Education Authority are looking for now is the declaration, which is in our CEF, uh, guidance, uh, which just to say again, is, is fresh up on our website this morning for you all on the front page of the website. So do have a look at that. Gavin's resources there are super, and Gavin, you're content. We're going to share these slides after this. We've also recorded this morning, so it will go up on our CEF YouTube channel. So again, uh, we'll publish the link to that. And you might want to share that with colleagues or, or people in your supply chain. I think for me, Gavin, that, that's the most important thing here is it's, it's not about your direct employees. It's, it's about looking a little bit further and actually, as you say, no shame in finding it, but shame for not looking for it. So it's about being a supportive culture. Uh, through uh, the uh, uh, yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, there, there's, there's no point saying that there's a potentially 136,000 victims in the UK alone, 24.9 victims of labour exploitation in the world, 50 million people at any one time exploited in modern slave in the world and saying that construction is potentially a high risk sector to be involved in. And then saying, I've checked and I see nothing of concern. Yeah. People understand that there are going to be potential risks. It doesn't mean that you're involved in it, but it means that you've done some due diligence to identify what the potential risk could be and that you're taking proportionate and reasonable steps to mitigate those risks. And by doing it, you're doing a good thing for the people who could be potentially being exploited by those preventative measures. And you're also really doing some things to hopefully help your business and make you an attractive business for other people who want to work with. Yeah, I don't think you'd wrap the session up any better than that statement. That's <laughs> tremendous. So again, and listen, I want to thank you uh, for approaching CEF uh, and for hosting this today. I think I think that's been very, very useful. Your details will be shared with everybody who made it. And uh, obviously you're, you're content to follow up with them and provide support. But again, yeah. thank you very much. No worries. I, I'll be delighted. If anybody wants to get in touch at all, uh, I'd be I'd be over the moon. Uh, I'm, I'm really keen uh, with the social enterprise to work with people in the construction sector and be able to show a lot of the good things that we have in Northern Ireland and a lot of those risks are mitigated here already. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you to everybody who joined us this morning. Hope you find it useful and we'll see you in the next CEF webinar. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.